Um, good morning, everybody. I, uh, I'm only going to take about 10 minutes to describe um, to describe this project of STSN USA, uh, which involves zooming through more than 10 slides and don't read through them. I think it's just the subtitles that are interesting for you to get a feel. Um, and then at the end, I think the idea is to have a little bit of a discussion or at least an opportunity for questions. So this is a project by, uh, by the SDSN network in the USA. It was launched in November 24th. And to give you a background, um, there is an analog to the Fable project that's existed since 2015, as you all know, that's called DDPP, the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project that focuses on decarbonizing the energy in the transport sectors, uh, the building sector. Uh, but, but same idea, pathways to mid-century for deep decarbonization and largely technical modeling base exercises. And what was felt was that we needed an analog to that project that was taking for granted a given pathway that's sustainable and getting us to zero, um, but laying out with a lot of specificity what the, what the specific uh, policies would be needed to get the country onto that uh, technical trajectory. So, so that's that's how the zero carbon action plan was born. Um, uh, it brings together all policy folks. So these are not modeling folks. These are folks who take the modeling, and they're they're people who are experts in policy, who are lawyers and experts in legislation, uh, know inside and out uh, the laws and the policy environment of the United States around this. Um, and it's at the same time, it's unique because unlike many, many other policy exercises, this one's going to be very, very specific because it's based on uh, this time-bound specific pathway that the modeling work has done. And so that's what makes it unique. It's a policy exercise with a very firm and rigorous technical backbone, uh, which most policy exercises do not have because the policy folks don't have that modeling and that technical expertise. So the work um, uh, covers six major sectors, power, uh, transportation, buildings, industry, land use, and materials. And I'm just going to zoom through this and then spend a little bit more time on the land use since that's, um, that's the touch point with the FABLE uh, trajectory. So the key components basically for deep decarbonization is we need to electrify everything um, and, uh, but then really start going into very specific um, uh, legislative proposals for, and this is a focus on the federal government uh, of the US uh, to move towards that complete decarbonization. And again, don't worry about reading everything. I'm happy to share this PowerPoint with the group, but, but the details are not the point here. I think the idea here is to get a feel for what a policy exercise that goes with FABLE might look like. And, and this uh, are, are conversations that I've already started having with Cecil and with others. Um, and so this might offer one potential model for that. Uh, so as the, I think the thing to underline here, which in Fable, of course, is obvious, is that uh, this is a policy exercise that's built on a very specific trajectory. And so it's sitting down the lawyers and sitting down the policy experts on these different sectors, on buildings, on transport, uh, on the power system, and then trying to get to produce legislative proposals that adhere to a very specific uh, trajectory of infrastructure investments and an emissions trajectory identified by the systems engineers. And so that's that's what makes this a unique endeavor. Uh, and one of the things that they did, which is something we might want to think about in the FABLE context, is that once you have very specific pathways, they've been sure to cost all of this so that they can uh, speak to the question of how expensive a given trajectory would look like and a given set of investments look like. That, this is something we have not done in the FABLE context in terms of thinking about the, uh, the cost of, of different kinds of interventions that would put us on, these, uh, on the sustainable pathways that we've, that we've discussed. In addition uh, to giving uh, a policy pathway to 2050, a lot of activity, uh, I think at the global scale, and this is starting to percolate down to the countries, is to say, um, as part of laying out your commitments to mid-century, you also have to articulate what you're going to do in the next 10 years. For too long, we've been uh, having lofty goals for decades away with very little action uh, in, uh, in the current time with people just kicking that can down the road. And so one of the things that, uh, that this project did, the, the ZCAP project is in addition to laying out policy pathways to mid-century, it also articulates exactly what needs to happen in the next 10 years in order to put the country on something that's compatible to that medium term or longer term 
uh, pathway. And, and, and so you see some of those recommendations for where the country should be in 2030 if it has a, uh, a chance at being at where at, uh, at zero carbon by 2050. And uh, just to emphasize the kind of people who, who would be leading this work in the case of, of ZCAP, uh, you know, these Don Dern, uh, John Dernbach and Michael Gerard are, are lawyers. They're environmental lawyers with deep expertise on policy and on, and on legislation. And so they laid out the backbone of what, what, the, what the legislative project and framework would look like in the U.S. context to achieve deep, deep decarbonization. And so very specific policy proposals for Congress, uh, things on, on commitments, but also on exactly what the administration could be doing, uh, the creation of a White House office on climate change, uh, uh, the creation of enforceable national plans, a timetable for the White House to produce those things, uh, updates that the administration should be reporting to Congress every two years. So you see a level of specificity on policy frameworks and on mechanics of legislation uh, that, that, that try to move this forward. Recommendations for research and development funding, uh, recommendations on carbon pricing and the, uh, the social cost of carbon and the role of that inside, uh, inside this policy framework, issues on regulation, subsidies, social justice and environmental justice concern to, to, uh, to deal with the just transition um, considerations of all of this. And so those are cross-cutting ideas that they give to the government and then very specific pillars for decarbonization. And again, just focus on the subtitles here. Um, so a, a pillar for decarbonizing electricity and then a set of recommendations to Congress on that, uh, energy efficiency and conservation, uh, and, and speaking to very specific existing um, uh, uh, policies of different departments of government. In this case, you see something on the Department of Energy and its authority. Uh, electrification and of transportation and buildings, very specific policy proposals to do that, uh, uh, and then something on carbon capture as, as, as broad pillars. So uh, that's kind of the big picture legislation that the lawyers put together. Of course, I'm skimming over all of the details, but to give you the idea. <clears throat> and then there were separate chapters on all of these things led by policy experts of those sectors. So there was a chapter on the power sector, a chapter on buildings, a chapter on transportation, a chapter on materials, a chapter on, um, on, uh, on what states and local jurisdictions should be doing, uh, and then a chapter on land use, since, of course, in the U.S., uh, uh, land use is about 8% uh, of, um, of emissions, and, uh, and that was an important part of the puzzle. And these are the major sections of, of the land use chapter. Uh, and I put the names of, the, of, the, um, of my colleagues there. The only name that's missing is Grace Wu because she wasn't in this presentation because she was on maternity leave. But Grace and I served as the bridge to the, uh, to the FABLE modeling that. So we, we brought the, the US country team, uh, the FABLE US country teams uh, trajectory as, uh, as the touch point and the, the guide for these land use recommendations. So a big thing is, of course, citing renewable energy uh, infrastructure in the United States. Well, um, and I should say that, of course, this is this is all based on on the fable trajectory. But interestingly, it also brings from the from the energy modeling how much uh, wind and solar energy you're going to need for full decarbonization and what the land use implications of that. Something we haven't explicitly incorporated into fable in the United States, for example, by mid-century. Uh, on the what, what's called the central pathway for the systems engineers on deep decarbonization, the U.S. will need the equivalent of the land of the size of New Mexico in terms of wind installation, and the equivalent of the size of New Hampshire and Vermont in terms of solar power installation. So we're talking about a land use footprint for renewable energy infrastructure that's massive. And thinking about the land use implications of this is, is an important piece of the puzzle that so far in Fable we haven't, we haven't deeply considered. Um, and so the first part of the chapter goes through the, the, the legal and policy challenges around citing renewable infrastructure and how to do this with the focus on designing uh, uh, ma uh, policies that are integrative and very transparent for the siting process. As you may know, in the United States, most land is privately owned. And so siting large scale new infrastructure is a very challenging, um, uh, very challenging set of policy, uh, uh, policy hurdles that need to be jumped. Um, so issues here for siting on the need for integration, uh, for, uh, for an integrated framework to do that, for transparent 
uh, citing processes for financing uh, and, uh, and working with host communities that will be impacted by all of this new uh, rollout of infrastructure. Policies to promote reforestation, a, a, a big part of, of FABLE's uh, sustainable pathway for the United States. So what um, the idea of we need spatially explicit mapping to show where are the, these proposed reforested areas going to be in the US uh, based on, the, uh, on good science to show where that's most feasible and most consequential. And then funding sources based on federal cost share programs, tax programs, state and local programs, forest carbon programs, all with a lot of specificity on what the federal government could do to actually promote uh, reforestation instead of just saying that we're going to reforest uh, X amount of land or X amount of trees by 2050. Uh, work on soil carbon, again, financial programs and other programs, hiring much more extension staff to work with farmers on low-till agriculture and other techniques uh, to reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture and maintain more, more soil and carbon. Uh, same thing with advanced biofuels and research and development for, for next generation biofuels. Again, this is this part touches with the energy modeling because the energy modelers have an amount of liquid fuels that will be required for sectors like aviation. And so a zero carbon uh, economy will still require some biofuels, even with complete electrification of, uh, of large parts of the economy, will need some liquid fuels uh, for things like aviation and perhaps shipping. Uh, and that needs to come from next generation biofuels. And, and of course, that, that will have land use consequences. Um, a transition to low carbon diets, uh, also an important part of the US pathway for FABLE towards uh, a sustainable pathway. Um, and so working with the updated uh, federal guidelines on, how, on diets, uh, the idea of climate friendly certification like we have organic certification allows a price wedge to be driven, a price premium uh, for agricultural production that's climate friendly or low carbon. Uh, and then taking advantage of the procurement of the federal government, a, a large buyer of food for the prison system for all federal property and making sure that the procurement is going towards bringing in low carbon sources of food for that. And finally, working with our welfare programs like, uh, like the Women and Infant and Children program, WIC or SNAP, which is our food stamps program in the US, all can be uh, can be guided towards uh, in, uh, encouraging people to buy uh, more fruits and vegetables, less unhealthy foods, which are which are more carbon intense. So again, very, very specific policy recommendations in the US context that would put us onto the fable, the fable pathway. Reduction of food and waste, building on existing programs by the Environmental Protection Agency and the US Department of Agriculture, which both have a, a target of reducing food uh, food waste by, by 50% in 2030, but then going through very specific ideas and guidelines and funding strategies that might actually move society in that, in that direction. And finally, a set of overarching policy recommendations for the land use sector for decarbonization, the idea of a federal um, uh, a laboratory on land. We have ARPA Energy and other uh, ARPAs, which are cutting edge uh, financial mechanisms for innovation in the US, having one dedicated to land that specifically is trying to work on the complex technical challenges of decarbonizing the land sector an interagency task force of land that coordinates multiple agencies that have some sort of incidence on how land is used in the United States. We've talked about this in other countries as well. So you've got a, an environment ministry, an agriculture ministry, a climate change ministry, and, and these all need to come together in technical cross-cutting task forces to think about the complexity of land use um, uh, and, and, and the renewable infrastructure siting, which will increasingly become, uh, become a challenge. And then finally, underneath all this, the recommendation to the government that they take all these decisions and think about these problems uh, on top of a backbone of integrated spatial planning uh, of the style that FABLE does. Um, but just in general, that, that these decisions made across all of these sectors need to happen um, on top of a geospatially explicit integrated spatial planning framework that, that the government should have. So that's the idea. Let me let me stop there. That was just a, a little bit more of a deep dive into the chapter on land use. But but what I, the flavor I wanted to impart is that this is something that we could be thinking about uh, as fable and in the context of lots of other countries, of an extension to the work of the the modeling work that we've done over the last few years and really moving into the policy sphere, bringing aboard people who are. 
uh, really deeply policy experts and lawyers and legislative experts for all of our respective countries and pushing out products like this that speak to the, le the, the legal frameworks and, and the existing laws and institutions in our different countries. Let me stop there. Um, and that was fast, I know, and I'll share all of these details. Uh, I'll share the PowerPoint for those of you who are interested, but the details I think were less important than the overall idea.